Uncle Data here, and this is the first and opening podcast episode of uh, Uncle Data. Um, in this opening episode, I'm gonna cover uh, two topics. So one is gonna be a couple Python libraries which are written or being written in Rust, and of course the upcoming PyCon event in Vilnius uh, that will happen on May 17th to 20th. So actually, uh, maybe I'm a bit too late to this whole, you know, hype train about trust, um, but uh, I don't know. Uh, let's see how it goes, you know, and maybe, you know, you'll take something out of it. So Rust in general uh, first appeared uh, in 2015, and it's actually, you know, blazingly fast, you know, super memory efficient, and uh, it doesn't have runtime or garbage collector. And can actually power <clears throat> anything performance critical, right? So and run on embedded devices, and it's actually easily can integrate with other languages. So one of the reasons you know why I'm talking and why I mentioned I'm going to mention them. So some of the libraries which are written or going to be rewritten in Rust, uh, but going to be wrappers around Python, and that somehow a bit uh, <laughs> sentence a bit uh, with with the tone earlier, but anyway, nonetheless. Um, so it's a quite powerful language, right? And it's uh, super fast and it should uh, should at some point become a standard, but uh, I'm talking here more, you know, from the data engineering perspective or like, you know, from the data area itself. Uh, but before, you know, I'm gonna talk about this, you know, I'm gonna give you a fun fact that uh, <clears throat> Rustations, uh, basically, you know, the people, you know, who code in Rust and actually why their logo is kind of a crab in some in some situations. Uh, it's because it comes from a word crustacean, which actually, you know, is like a group of uh, species. And wh when I'm talking about, you know, the crabs and these things, so this is the neat little book I got uh, as a, a, a friend lended it to me uh, because when I saw, you know, the a lot of in community you know making noise about trust so mm, i knew that he had it you know he's a frustration himself so i had to actually you know get it but somehow i'm not managing you know my time very well and it's just basically for now just collecting the dust mm. but i guess you know for some people it sits and collects dust like myself right but for some other as you know you can see in data community you know that they're actually doing some things you know they're trying out you know doing some comparisons you know i've seen you know uh some spark like data frame manipulations uh which uh were like initially like the library was built in rust and the person did you know some computational you know performance benchmarking you know compared to spark so <clears throat> that's actually you know quite interesting you know, to see you know that it's already getting got some traction there right and uh Let's see how the it will turn out, right? Um, if you're, you know, if you're looking, you know, in general, on those libraries, so one of those libraries which are written in Rust uh, with Arrow uh, right beside, uh, heavily using it. Um, like before, I give introduction. You know, so everyone knows pandas, right? Uh, no one is. Uh, I assume you know you're not living under the rock, you know, and you know what polars is <clears throat> so apart from being you know uh, a different kind of bear you know uh, we have pandas we have uh, koalas you know now we have polars let's see maybe there's going to be a grizzly bear later or grizzly uh, or most likely it is just i'm not aware anyway so um polars is uh, a very neat little can will not call it little a very neat and powerful library, which, uh, like mentioned, is uh, written in Rust and utilizes Arrow, and it allows you know data frame interface. <clears throat> so how I see it, you know, it's like pandas and steroids, or uh, in this case, uh, based on speed, you know, and performance, I guess it's maybe pandas and super soldier serum. Not sure how many Marvel fans you know are listening, so. Uh, get the reference uh if not you know you can google you know what's the super soldier serum uh but the thing is that actually you know the library itself is not new so um like i mentioned the friend from whom i borrowed this book you know he's like uh crazy into uh, rust 
And um, so I remember, you know, when I first saw it, I just sent him, you know, a link, you know, and said like, oh, damn, you know, Rust is already, you know, breaking into data science uh, and analytics. And uh, I checked the message is actually dated, you know, 2021, May 10th. So roughly almost two years ago, right? So in my, in, in, like, there were some thoughts in my head, right? So why did it take, you know, around two years, you know, for the library in general to get traction, right? So most likely, you know, at that point, you know, it wasn't that maybe feature rich, right, to push it. Uh, maybe Rust, you know, wasn't picking up a lot of uh, attention, you know, from uh, data community. And uh, like maybe some other, I don't know, reasons why. But, you know, it's there now. And it's actually, you know, a very <clears throat> powerful thing, you know, what can, uh, you know, help us analyze, you know, bigger than, you know, fits the memory uh, use cases. So in general, if we would look, you know, on the, what we have, you know, in the polars, <laughs> GitHub, right? So for me, it's actually interesting, you know, yeah, you can see, you know, similar things, you know, like Spark, lazy, eager execution, it's multi-threaded, query optimization. So a lot of things, you know, and a lot of similarities with uh, Spark. If we would see, you know, the syntax and how it runs, right? <clears throat> yeah, data frame creation kind of resembles, you know, pandas. But if you look, you know, as um, how it's executed, you know, what's happening there. Uh, Spark, uh, call me, call, filter, lit, you know. So I guess, you know, there's a lot of inspiration you know, from Spark in general, but sh uh, shift it, you know, on Rust, which actually will be a bit more, <clears throat> I guess, uh, performance uh enhanced maybe approach instead of you know jvm approach mm. one of the reasons why i actually you know like spark is that uh it's quite flexible you know and it allows you know to write sql expressions you know with a little bit of uh, manipulation so similarly you know polars uh does the same and uh yeah there are a lot of you know benchmarks um, that are actually you know quite popular you know in data community oh i'm benchmarking this on that you know you can see you know that there are like <coughs> A lot of places where it runs uh, fast, right? Even in being lightweight, you know, on impo importing things. So <clears throat> um, I think it's gonna be, you know, interesting how it will evolve. And uh, a small teaser, you know, what I'm gonna mention a bit later is um, <clears throat> how uh, maybe what's planned for the polars, you know, in the near future. Now let's take a look, you know, uh, about other interesting language. And it's actually, you know, like I found that that library when uh, we were hiring, you know, for a data engineer and we actually sent out, you know, a test, uh, you know, like a general data engineering part, right? You extract some data from some place, right? And you just, you know, do some manipulations, you know, validations and push, you know, to the data warehouse, you know, model in the end. And actually, you know, like I was reviewing, you know, one candidate's code and I'm like, hmm, what's this pedantic? Like with base models and whatnot, like what's happening? Like first time I'm seeing, you know, and just like, you know, like verified, you know, how it's used, you know, what's happening in the code and so on. It's like, oh, that's nice. <clears throat> then I researched, re researched, you know, the whole library and it's like, oh, purely Pythonic, you know, used in, uh, and it allows, you know, data validations, you know, uh, and can force type hints, you know, and it's like user friendly errors and so on. <clears throat> so, if uh, if you if you have been following, you know, the data uh, data fuss, or like the the fuss uh, that was created, you know, by data community um, some time ago, you would know, you know, that actually Pydantic is uh, gonna have a V two version released. And uh, it's gonna be rewritten in in Rust. So basically, you know, the whole re re rewrite, you know, of this library is gonna happen in Rust. And um, in general, why I uh, like I'm super interested, you know, how this is gonna evolve, is that uh, it's uh, it's quite heavily, you know, adopted, you know, in, uh, in general in development, you know, uh, a lot of uh, like libraries are using it right so 
fast API, you know, if I'm not mistaken, is using, you know, and basically if you're creating, you know, APIs in general, right, it's super neat for you, you know, to validate it. So even though, you know, like always, you know, people are trying to see, you know, um, how it's gonna work out, uh, it, nothing will break, you know, after a major upgrade and so on, you know, but it's gonna be interesting, you know, how it will affect the speed, you know, like all of the things related, you know, to the performance, you know, and later on, you know, the adoption of the community with different approach, right? Because previously it was Python, Python based, so contributions, you know, you know to uh, open sourced uh, repository, you know, is way uh, going to be narrowed down just because, you know, like there are less people you know, can write code in Rust, right? But um, let's see how it goes. Um, another library uh, which appeared in my reader, like I think a couple months back, somewhere there, you know, it's called Raft. And uh, what I actually like, you know, that, uh, you know, rough in general is like a linter. So now, uh, you know, um, linters are quite useful, right? Uh, because uh, what's important for people? Um, so linter, you know, fixes, uh, like outlines, you know, all the issues, you know, in your code, like it doesn't follow standards and so on. But uh, it's, it's basically, you know, part of, uh, like whole development process, right? You have, you know, your test suits on CI CD, you know, you have, your, you know, formatting in black, you know, and like then linting comes up, right? And if those things take time, right? And you, you know, you're uh, like, you're evolving your code, you know, adding new things, you know, couple, couple, you know, like uh, pull requests, you know, a day or whatnot. It's actually later on, you know, waiting on these things is gonna consume like overall, you know, like quite long period of time, right? Uh, so, you know, you can control, you know, on test suits, you know, you can, like the black is quite quite efficient, you know, but on the linting part, right? It's not that fast. And uh, the thing is that, you know, actually why it's, why I think, you know, it's gonna be next big thing rough as well, right? Is that it's actually, you know, at from 10 to 100 times faster, you know, than the existing linters. So why not, right? If it already, you know, covers the job, you know, and can uh, almost like replace existing Flake 8, you know, uh, and other dozen, you know, like whatever plugins, you know, all these things, you know, like for me personally, it's already like a win-win situation, right? I can already see, you know, that it's used in uh, like major open source projects, right? Apache Airflow, Fast API, Hugging Face, Panda, SciPy. And why they did that? Of course, the development uh, experience, you know, for people. And you don't have to, you know, wait and just, you know, bash your head, you know, oh, if it's, you know, run smoothly or not, right? So I would say, you know, those are three big libraries, you know, which are gonna be the uh, three musketeers at the start, right? For more, like, more widely, you know, adopted in the data community. And I guess more will follow. Uh, Let's see how it will shape up, you know, and how it will turn out, you know, in the end here. But, right, I mentioned, you know, I'm gonna talk about PyCharm, you know. So why I'm promoting, you know, this event now, and uh, why I'm actually, you know, in general, you know, doing this, right? So I'm gonna give you, you know, a bit of a brief, uh, brief introduction, you know, so, so you might have seen, you know, if you're following me on LinkedIn, that I may, made a post, you know, that um, like my speech was accepted, you know, into PyCon 2023. And uh, <clears throat> this was one of my, you know, main goals, you know, like before I get to age 35, you know, want to do, you know, public, spe uh, public speaking you know, or like, you know, presentation you know, in a conference, you know, and actually, you know, since I know that my stronger suit, you know, at least at this point, you know, or like when I was creating, you know, that goal, uh, was technical when I raised those goals. Actually, you know, what was, I knew like very little, you know, Python, whatnot, it was like, I think when I was 27, you know, something like that. So I had like, you know, like bare bones knowledge, you know, of, uh, of uh, like Python, you know, usual things on data warehousing and whatnot. So I didn't knew much, you know, about a lot of open source tooling, you know, and so on. 
And uh, looking back, you know, like I got my experience, you know, I uh, spent a lot of time, you know, doing Apache Spark things, you know, then we uh, like at Quix, you know, we had the introduction of Apache Airflow, you know, and basically then I'm like, oh, damn, that's nice, right? So I spent my, a lot of time, you know, checking uh, multiple things in those libraries, you know, on Apache Spark, I um, did a lot of uh, fine tuning, you know, like, you know, doing uh, some workshops, you know, just to get, you know, people up to basic speed, you know, of how to use, you know, how to run it and whatnot. And uh, it, those two, you know, open source projects kind of followed me, you know, along the way uh, in different companies. Uh, but with Apache Spark, you know, I think my last, like, to some extent known version was 3.1 and I saw that they're releasing a 3.4. They released it already. So uh, three versions, at least three versions behind, right? And it doesn't make sense. And uh, since I'm heavily relying on Airflow, it's uh, one of, you know, the one of the strongest used suits, but not on like, you know, like the internals, you know, uh, adding, you know, committing to open source and uh, so on. It's more like, you know, from the development side uh, and from the usage as a, you know, as a data engineer, not from the infrastructure. Just... So now how, how is the PyCon, right, falls into this? So actually I participated in 2019 uh, and actually see, you know, oh, <clears throat> okay, people are sharing, you know, their ideas, you know, it's like Python. I'm like, okay, I didn't saw, you know, many events before. And uh, hmm, maybe this is a place, you know, where I could actually, you know, do it at some point. <clears throat> so it took me, you know, a while, you know, to get my confidence up, you know, to figure out the topic I want to work at and so on. So, yeah, this is, uh, this year is the fourth PyCon, uh, even though they actually started in 2009. But, you know, <clears throat> it's quite interesting to see, you know, how to what the event evolved, even, you know, for me looking, you know, from 2019, you know. So... Yeah, a bit pushing pushing myself, you know, out of comfort zone, you know, and like basically thinking of a topic and the name for it. Mm, let's see how it's going to go. But uh, if you remember, you know, I mentioned a lot of uh, like a couple libraries, you know, before. So some of them were actually, you know, I quite intended, you know, to do them uh, before, but I see it as a good opportunity you know, to combine them so now uh, why i'm talking about combining combining them <clears throat> is uh, um, i mentioned pydantic right so uh, samuel colvin is the creator of pydantic and uh, that uh, that's one of the connections you know what i mentioned before to the pycon so samuel is gonna give a keynote so i'm gonna gonna be extending my ears out and listening to what he's gonna, uh, what he has to say, you know, about, uh, uh, you know, in general, you know, about Pydantic, uh, its future, you know, maybe he'll express, you know, uh, twists and turns, you know, while he was uh, rewriting it in Rust and whatnot, you know, so that's gonna be an interesting thing. But for all of the further, you know, things what I would like to cover, you know, in upcoming PyCon, is uh like i'm gonna try to wrap it you know in like in uh data journey story right so <clears throat> so let's start you know like with uh the regular things like you know that data has to be created right it doesn't start from nowhere right? it doesn't appear from thin air it's either you know some first party tooling you know it's like ads ads information and whatnot but actually you know someone has to create them uh, we have databases, right? But data that doesn't appear automatically. So we have, you know, some data producers, right? Uh, now, who's on the other end, you know, are data consumers, right? And what happens in the middle? So in the middle, we have, you know, very nice and neat, you know, data pipelines, right? So what happens in those pipelines, you know, it's like data engineering magic. So let's start, you know, with... Uh, one of my you know like i mentioned uh, two two topics or like two tools which uh drove me you know to very interesting places you know and like i, I did uh, did run some deep dives on 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 them so on one i'm gonna talk right another one is like i'm i'm very very keenly you know waiting for uh for this workshop so uh 
So there's going to be a workshop, and it's called, uh, it's called you know, the Unlocking the Power of PySpark, a comprehensive workshop. It's going to be, you know, led by Karsten Fromhold, and uh, <clears throat> going to be interesting, you know, how much it has evolved, you know, at least from when I was using it, and what it is now, you know, how many of uh, more capabilities uh, it's allowing you to do performance tweaking, you know, and so on. Um, like, and in general, you know, why I like Spark, you know, is that it allows, you know, you can choose data frame API, you can choose SQL, you know, it's, uh, it has a lot of, you know, uh, different APIs in general, language wise, right? You can write in Python, you can write in Scala, you know, you can write in Java and so on. Very similarly, like to the next library, which is gonna have like a talk. So Polos, right? Uh, so, uh, Polar's uh, creator, Richie Wink, uh, is going to give a talk, you know, which is named Polar's Done the Fast, Now the Scale. Uh, why the, the talk name got me intrigued and all of the similarities, you know, in uh, Polar's and Spark, I have a feeling, you know, that uh, there are plans in the future, you know, to run it not on single node, you know, but move it more like uh, to distributed computing. So uh, gonna be interesting, you know, what Richie is actually gonna talk about, but I have a feeling, you know, that there might be, you know, a fiercer battle, you know, uh, on the Spark end, right? Uh, if you compare, you know, with, uh, other data frame, like APIs, right? Wax, uh, Dask, Modin, you know, um, that are, you know, already available in Python, you know, so performance-wise, Polar's, beat them and you know spark, spark before you know them they didn't have much you know like troubles right it was by far superior now there's new kid on the block right and he just misses you know like distributed part so single note for uh, we, uh performance very well interesting what's in the future what's in the future you know how it's gonna you know try to beat spark you know at its own game um yeah, but, you know, let, let's go back, you know, to Polaris a bit, you know, it's written on Rust and it's using Arrow, right? We have Pandas, right? So what will happen to Pandas then, right? And everyone now, you know, from uh, JavaScript, you know, like to uh, the same Rust, right? Can use Arrow, right? It's a super, superb library, you know, for uh, for basically, you know, uh, accessing, you know, files and, you know, you know, doing, you know, some quick manipulations if you need. Uh, Spark uses it under the hood in some cases, you know, when converting from pandas, right? So it allows very, very neat, you know, options for anyone then, you know, to access the same files, you know, in fast matter, right? Lazy, <clears throat> lazy version, uh, lazy evaluation as well. So gonna be interesting what pandas has to say, you know, for all of this, uh, you know, having that much skin in the game, you know, being the, in some cases, you know, de facto standard, you know, in data community, you know, if you have to do something, <laughs> let's try Pandas, right? <clears throat> so there's going to be a talk, which is called Pandas 2.0 and the Arrow Revolution. It's going to be uh, like the presenter is going to be Mark Garcia and Mark is a Pandas core developer. So I'm very, very interested, you know, where Pandas in general, you know, all this fuss, you know, uh, gonna stand. Uh, what are the plans there? You know, and how are they going to try and keep you know at the top where they are now? So you know, we talked about the pipelines. You know, like or like the pipelines in this case. You know, some um, Spark code. You know, like Polar's code, whatever. Right? You have you know your Python files somewhere. You have to execute them, right? So we can do cron jobs. You know, but if you have any more dependencies and other things. Uh, what you have to do, right? You have to, you know, like create DAGs. So talking about DAGs, right? Um, Apache Airflow is one of the, I would say the most mature um, at this point, you know, from community standpoint to you and by the market share, I guess they have. Uh, but with, uh, with some of the players on the orchestrator side, you know, making more noise. Uh, some people are starting to ask questions, you know, is uh, actually 
Apache Airflow, you know, the go-to orchestrator if you're starting, you know, your data journey. So in my eyes, you know, like the two biggest, you know, voices, you know, of this, or like, you know, the people who are comparing, you know, uh, different orchestrators, they're comparing, you know, Airflow, Dexter, and uh, the new kid, like the very, very fresh kid on the block, MageAI. Um, so let's start with Daxter. So Daxter basically, you know, uh, glows, you know, like their terms, you know, like, oh, data assets, you know, software defined assets, you know, and like how, uh, how you know, Airflow treats everything as a task and we're treating everything as an asset, you know, a bit of different, uh, you know, uh, terms, you know, and capabilities. Um, so to compare, you know, so the first release, you know, of Dexter was in 2018, you know, like in, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in August. And the V1, you know, is actually launched, you know, last year in August, right? So 2022. Uh, if we would look, you know, at Mage AI, like super fresh guy uh, in town, uh, like super, super fresh player, you know, in town. So the company in general, like, you know, was established, I think, in 2021, and they did the first release, you know, in uh, 2022, January. Uh, actually, you know, when I check their uh, release page, you know, it's super nice, you know, to see that they're uh, coming up with funny names uh, or like, you know, some uh, to their releases. So they started with some lunar, you know, kind of namings, and then you, you can see, you know, like, oh, uh, this release is now the 90s show, you know, and I think the latest one, that I saw, you know, when I'm recording, you know, this was Super Mario Bros. So, you know, they're trying, you know, on that end as well to be funny, you know, and witty. Um, and uh, both Daxter and Mage, you know, they're uh, presenting themselves, you know, as like we're trying to do what Airflow isn't doing, right? So I'm going to try and answer, you know, this question, you know, is, uh, is it actually the end of Apache Airflow? So tune in, you know, to to my speech, you know, to see, you know, if you have to be worried, you know, of your Apache Airflow instance, you know, be, or, or, or the big migration, you know, but anyway, uh, I digress here, you know, like I'm a bit too much of my shameless plugging, you know, but uh, let's go, you know, with our data story, right? So we have, you know, so our data pipelines, you know, running, you know, the orchestrated, you know, Data's coming into our like data lake, data warehouse, you know, hopefully not a data swamp or uh, just in general, you know, some random place where everyone dumps everything, you know, and they later on see that, you, you know, just storage bill is just increasing, but we don't have value. So the natural next step, you know, in general is to create some, or like the easiest application or like the most common, maybe one is like, you know, to create some um, machine learning model which would actually do some predictions, right? And it will drive your business uh, decisioning, you know, in the right way. So currently, you know, there's a lot of buzz, you know, on the large language models, you know, like chat GPT, you know, GPT-4, you know, and so on. And it has been, you know, for a quite a while. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, if you're, uh, if you're new or, you know, you want to like break in into, you know, your first data science job, uh, you know, you have to you have to know some things, you know, you have to have some information about it, you know. So let's talk about, you know, getting your first data scientist job, right? Because data scientists are actually the people, you know, who are doing, you know, the modeling, you know, validations, exploratory analysis, you know, business case understands and a lot of other things, you know. And in some cases, you know, like uh, uh, juggling, you know, like data engineering part, data analyst part, you know, on their on their day-to-day -day job, right? So, but, you know, let's say, you know, you want to do pure, purely, you know, data scientist job. Um, I, in my LinkedIn feed, you know, you know, I noticed, you know, a trend, you know, that uh, people, you know, say like, okay, if you want to become a data scientist, you know, like build your portfolio, right? Create, you know, how, like just do it, you know, on GitHub, you know, show, showcase, you know, what you're doing, how you're doing and so on. And it kind of, you know, resonated with me as well, but from a different angle, right? When I'm looking at the applicants, right, uh, if I have an open position, right, if they have a GitHub page, I always open it, check, you know, if they're actually, you know, doing some of the coding, you know, like, you know, pushing some code, you know, to, to GitHub on their own. If it's not only, you know, some forked, you know, repositories, you know, like, 
and just you know nothing you know just forked it and that's it right so from from the code they they push to get right you can already you know see how they think and whatnot the code quality and these kind of things so similarly you know i i think you know that that will uh, help too for data scientists you know to show you know how they're creating things <clears throat> but actually i'm not a data scientist you know uh, i haven't <clears throat> I have no clue actually you know how a good portfolio looks uh of a data scientist right so one of the things uh why i actually will try to tune in you know to carolina Brizunia talk which is named how to build a data science portfolio that will make recruiters swipe right is just to get a bigger understanding of for me in uh, majority of the cases is, uh as a data specialist you know what to what to look for, right? What uh, maybe in other disciplines, you know, they're focused on different things. And maybe I want to position myself, you know, more to that. <clears throat> well, in some cases, you know, like even if I'm if I'm a hiring manager and uh, like what to look out for, you know, and can this portfolio. So I'm going to be an interesting, you know, exploratory talk, at least for, for my end, right? So <clears throat> now let's continue our story, right? um you got your job right you're actually you know, doing you know some um <clears throat> modeling but the thing is that you know what you do you know you're actually running your, your code you know usually locally right um what to do if it runs slowly you know you want to maybe improve the performance of it right maybe you know occasionally it throws out you know some out of memory exceptions you know and some other things you know um what to do and how to you know uh, troubleshoot you know where it's bottlenecking actually so uh one of the options is actually do some memory profiling so the topic is going to be covered by uh i'm not gonna butcher the name because i have no idea how to pronounce it uh but the talk's name is going to be driving down the memory lane profiling your data science group so from my end you know like I'm usually, you know, the guy, you know, who's not doing the memory profiling because my work is a bit different kind. Uh, but actually, you know, I notice, you know, that sometimes, you know, checking where you have, you know, the biggest uh, memory, like how to say now, uh, like where's the biggest part of uh, of the memory is clo uh, clogged, right? Maybe you can, you know, do some speeding up and it will allow you to do that. So it's gonna be interesting, you know, maybe tips and tricks I can transfer, you know, to uh, to my own skill set. So, you know, second part is done, right? We, we got the job, right? We created, you know, some models, you know, we made them, we, we made them efficient. Um, and uh, now what's left, right, is to push it to production right in order to push it to production right we have to deploy it somewhere and uh, we have to make it available you know uh via api right and then we have to of course monitor you know if we don't have any issues you know uh, response rates and uh, you know these kind of things uh can we do that in python <laughs> of course we can you know there are bazillion you know web frame web development frameworks you know like you know we can build a lot of apis and quite efficient ones so we can if if you are like me you know interested on on that end as well right being an all-rounder you know data person you can listen in on monica venchko skater talk uh which is named actually ml model serving and monitoring with fast epa so i'm gonna shoot two birds with one stone so i'm gonna understand i guess a bit more you know about fast epi and a bit more you know how to push uh, ml um ml models you know to production and monitor them so yeah we you know everything is in production you know quite good you know but in general you know when we think about you know the whole you know operational part right uh we need you know processes we need you know like actually you know good ways of working you know tooling uh and a lot of other things right when you think about it right um so the thing is you know that uh, actually uh, i see ml ops uh in a similar way you know uh becoming a, a big thing uh in a similar way like you know devops uh came to life right uh, it's supposed to you know make a developer's life easier so in this case you know it's like 
machine learning engineers in life easier. <laughs> so um, if you want to familiarize, familiarize yourself, you know, MLOps, check out Artemis Gritsuna's talk, uh, which is named MLOps Fundamentals or what every machine learning engineer should know. The thing is what I, what I see, you know, if you're a data scientist, most likely you, you want to hear that too. Uh, because it's always interesting, you know, to know more, you know, outside of your, you know, kind of comfort zone because it will it will give you more value you know, later on. So uh, yeah, it looks like, you know, I just covered like, or like suggested seven or eight kind of talks, you know, to listen in, but actually there's gonna be a lot more, I think 50 plus talks, you know, on different other topics, <clears throat> but I did, you know, did my choice, you know, basically based on <clears throat> topic itself, right? If it's related to data, yeah, I, I'm most likely going to be there. So uh, check out PyCon.lt. Uh, check out, uh, you know, exist uh, like plan talks, you know, where they're going to happen and so on. Uh, if you see me, you know, in the PyCon, you know, don't be shy. Uh, uh, actually, I, I, re I really want to see, you know, and talk with different people and to understand their, you know, ideas, you know maybe you know exchange you know some ideas or approaches you know along the way um yeah i guess if you're gonna be there you know see you then if not and you're listening you know, to my uh podcast uncle data see ya in the next uncle data podcast episodes